instruments do you need? Well, unless you're doing alignment, and you wouldn't be doing any alignment unless you're really gone into this professionally. So actually all you really need is a vacuum tube or a digital voltmeter, ohmmeter, and uh, maybe a high voltage probe to measure the high voltage. Although it's not always necessary to measure the high voltage because I can tell you if the high voltage is low, there's something wrong and it's going to show up pretty quick. Usually a, a, a shorted flyback and uh, you shut the set off and feel the fly flyback. If it's hot, it's no good because it's got a short. Or some things connected to it can be shorted too like a, a feedback capacitor or uh, the yolks are connected to it. But uh, anything can, can do that. Usually if a yoke goes, shorts out, you get a wedge-shaped picture. Like there's two vertical yolks moving the picture up and down vertically. And if one goes, it just go, nothing happens. It just stays aligned in the middle of the street. But the other one is still working, so you get uh, a wedge-shaped picture. And that means one of your vertical yokes is either shorted or open. And uh, you best find out what it is. The horizontal could do the, the same thing, but maybe <coughs> there won't be enough uh, <coughs> B-plus boost left and stuff to even uh, light the picture. So uh, it's usually just a vertical that you see like that. <clears throat> now you have, in a TV set, you have a wonderful thing for checking your picture. And that is the picture tube. And you can pretty well tell which stage is bad by observing the picture tube. You don't have to go through a bunch of scopes and, and voltage readings and stuff like that. As long as you've got a raster. You know what a raster is? A raster is when the screen is being scanned by lines from top to bottom. And it just shows white. It might not show any picture, but it shows white. Or it could show a snowy picture. Or it could show a picture. But as long as you have a raster, you can tell a lot about a TV set. Just by examining the raster, and you, this is where you have to learn what to look for. For example, if the raster is clear without any snow, then it could be a bad video amplifier or a bad video detector, depending if you're getting sound or not. And if the raster is full of snow but no picture, it's usually the, the mixer of the oscillator. And if the, if the raster is full of snow and there's a weak picture, you can just see a very weak picture, it's usually the RF amplifier is burned out or, or shorted. And <clears throat> if the first IF amplifier goes, There'll still be a little bit of snow in the picture from the last two IF stages. This is where the snow is generated in these amplifier stages. And of course, the, the higher the gain, the more the snow. So you can get an idea. Uh, if you get a good TV working, pull some of these tubes out one at a time, especially if you've got a power transformer TV so it doesn't cool off on you. You can pull these tubes out one at a time and just notice what effect it has on the, on the raster. Uh, of course, if the picture is rolling, you notice something wrong with the vertical. If it's in a slanted lines, there's something wrong with the horizontal. If there's a, a hum in it in the speaker, 
there could be a bad uh, audio output tube or there could be a, a bad filter capacitor in the power supply. And there's many things, other things you can tell too. Like if the AGC isn't working, you can tell right away because you get a dark, a picture, very contrasty type of picture, and maybe the top of it will tend to bend over because it's overloading in one of the stages. This indicates an AGC trouble. Some AGC troubles will build up an excessive AGC voltage and just blank the screen right out so you don't see anything, just the raster. RCA does that. They have a little control. You turn it up and you get a stronger and stronger picture and all of a sudden it knocks the picture right off. Then you have to back it up a little bit till the picture comes in and that's supposed to be set. So you want it as strong as you can get it without knocking the picture off. That's AGC, automatic gain control. In radio it's AVC, automatic volume, volume control. Now here we have Power supplies, it's basically three power supplies used in the old TVs. The good old standby used the power transformer with a six volt winding and a 5U4 rectifier tube. And, and a type 80 tube or a 5Y3 it wasn't heavy enough to supply all those tubes. So they used a 5U4. Notice over here, across the primary, is a fuse and an on-off switch and two capacitors, one from each side of the line, and the center of the two capacitors is grounded. And that uh, <coughs> is to stop TV signals coming down the line and getting into the TV and going into the rectifier and cross-modulating and uh, producing hum bars in the picture. That's a modulation hum. Over here on the output of the rectifier tube, we have a, a filter. Notice the size of it, 80 at 450. And over here, the second filter, 100 at 450. And we have a choke coil uh, which is about uh, two and a half, three inches long over here. Has about a resistance of about 100 ohms. It doesn't drop the voltage very much, but it, it's necessary for it to be there to take the hum out, otherwise you get some hum bars in the picture. So you've got to have that choke. And this gives you about, depending on the transformer, but most of them put out about 260 volts DC. Now this next power supply is a half wave voltage doubler. Now it's powered by a straight off the line with 120 volts. There's the bypass condenser to drop the modulation. Um, Here's a fusing resistor, which uh, pretty well is a must to have that because we don't have a transformer to protect our rectifiers, I mean uh, to protect our filters. Um, we have a fusing resistor and we have a filter here. Pardon me. A fusing resistor and a capacitor. There's the polarity of the capacitor. 150 microfarad, 200 volt. Over here, we have a, a rectifier feeding off B plus, and we have another rectifier going back to the line. Notice these all have their bypass condensers on them too. Now some of the old sets might have selenium rectifiers in there instead of diodes. Uh, in which case it probably be a good idea to change them because after 50 years they get pretty weak and uh, 
you get a little bit more voltage with the diode, you can increase the value of this fuse resistor if you think the extra voltage is going to be, be too much. These are usually around seven and a half ohms, but you could put in a 12 ohm or a 15 ohm. And what they do, those fuse resistors, well, they act like a fuse. If there's a short or something, they will melt inside. But they also act when the filter comes on and it's not charged, it's like a direct short across the line. And it throws a heavy drain on the line, very hard on the filter. But by having a resistor in here, the filter charges gradually and uh, it's not going to damage itself. And the way that that works is this. This rectifier here charges that filter up in the direction that I've shown it, minus and plus. And when the next cycle comes, the charge on this capacitor is going to be in series with the next cycle that's coming. So it's going to add to the, the next 120 volt cycle. It's going to add to it. And it goes through another rectifier here and it produces, well, we end up with 260 volts, same as we did with this transformer. We have a choke, the same thing, and then 200 microfarad 450 volt filters. But if this filter opens up, the set goes dead. There's nothing. That's a halfway voltage doubler. It's not as good as this one, which is the full wave voltage doubler. <coughs> this one takes 120 volts. It's bypassed with the capacitor. One side is grounded. The other side goes through two diodes, one one way and one the other way. And this isn't grounded necessarily to chassis. It's just grounded to some kind of a terminal. <coughs> and what is grounded is this upper diode goes to ground, and it's going to be producing 150 or 160 volts, and it's going to add to this charge on this one, going to be do, producing 160 volts of the opposite polarity. And the two voltages are, are in series, they add together, making 260 volts, and it's the full wave thing. Actually, you wouldn't need as heavy of filters. But the only thing with these transformerless power supplies is they're dangerous because they have to be grounded somewhere to the chassis, and that means the chassis has to be uh, fixed up so nobody can touch it and get a shock. Maybe it's mounted on uh, uh, little rubber pads or something like that. But uh, it is a concern that, uh, that you don't have 120 volts connected directly to the metal chassis of a TV set. I got one more, one more circuit here and then we'll have some discussion. This is the IF response curve of a TV and a radio. Here's the radio here, very peaked and very narrow. But the, the IF response curve on a TV set, you'll see is 4.3 megacycles wide at the 50% level. That's from here to here, 50%. It's 4.3 megacycles wide. It's a, got to handle lots of video frequencies and that takes bandwidth. Now, in a TV station there's two transmitters. One is transmitting the sound and one is transmitting the video. And after those 
signals go through the mixer tube, no matter what channel you're on, the sound is on every channel is converted down to 41.25 mega, megahertz. And the video is converted down to 45.75. But you notice that the two of them are four and a half megacycles apart. And you'll notice on this, this is the sound carrier, you'll notice here that it's not very high. And that is because it, it has to be kept at about a 10% level. If it gets higher than that, it'll start making sound in the picture. Sound streaks through the picture when they speak. So you don't want that. And they have in here a trap tuned in to the frequency of the sound carrier, 41.25, and that reduces the sound down to 10%. It's a special coil. Uh, be difficult to make it because the spacing of this trap is very, has to be very accurate. Otherwise, it'll cut it down to 2% or 15% or something. Over here, we have adjacent channel traps. Now, adjacent channels, they originally thought they could have a, cha a channel on channel three, they could have another one on channel four, another one on channel five, but it didn't work out that way. Even with these adjacent channel traps, there was no way that you could stop a TV set broadcasting on the channel next to you from causing interference. So that's why they, there's always a space between uh, the TV channels. Now there's one exception to that. I'm not sure of the numbers. I think it's between uh, six and uh, seven. There's a big space between six and seven because of the, all the FM radio band is in there. So you could have a, a station on six, you could have a station on seven. <coughs> and of course in the tuner, the tuner uh, selects the channel that you want to receive by some kind of a rotary switch action. You can have just like band switches with coils mounted on them. Or maybe you've seen those ones that have the strips that you can take out and uh, the standard coil tuner. You can take the strips out and all the, all the coils are mounted on each strip. There's 12 uh, strips, one for each channel. They're a pretty good tuner. But what goes wrong with tuners is they get dirty. So they put some kind of contacts in there that are supposed to be good conductors, like silver. But silver has a habit of tarnishing, and then it doesn't always make good contact either. So if your TV tuner isn't being used for a long time, you're probably going to have to clean it. And uh, what are you going to clean it with? The best thing to do is to go to the electronic store and buy a, a product that is made to clean tuners. Now that doesn't mean to say you can clean volume controls with this stuff. It's for cleaning tuners, not volume controls. And the stuff made for cleaning volume controls is not necessarily good to use on tuners because what it does it gets all those little coils and band switches. It's a kind of an oily mixture for volume controls. And it gets them all saturated with this oily mixture. And it takes a month or more for that to dry out. <laughs> so it will throw everything off tune 
you'll have to reset your fine tunings and everything else. So the best is to get something made for tuners. And some of it has a, uh, a, a wild uh, abrasive in it, like uh, some kind of a cleanser, powder. And I, I would imagine that you could use a mixture of water and some kind of a cleanser powder and stir it all up and then take a little brush and wipe it around on the contracts, contacts and then wipe them off with a dry towel afterwards and you might be able to clean them pretty good if you can get at them. But the trouble is they're not all easy to get at. And you'll see little wires hooked between each terminal on the band switch. Those are the coils. And if you bend them, that's how they tune them. They just bend them a little bit. So you don't want to figure around moving any of them little coils. I used to fix tuners. And I, I did lots and lots of tuners. And I used to line every channel on them. Anyway, some other things that can happen are ghosts. If you're using an outside antenna, you can run into ghosts, especially in the old days when there was no cable. Uh, and especially in downtown Edmonton or anywhere down in the river valley, it was a bad situation. Uh, a ghost is, is something that uh, reflects a TV signal. Like if you're if you're downtown and you're getting a, we're getting a good bill, a fairly good picture, and the station is here and you're here, and somebody builds an apartment building here, some signal is going to bounce off of it and go over to your set. And it's going to take a little bit longer for that signal to get to your set. A couple of microseconds, maybe four or five microseconds. And it will make another picture on your screen about an inch or half an inch or wherever, how far it has to come uh, besides your regular picture. And don't forget, any metal building can make ghosts. And that goes for stucco. A stucco wire is just as good a coating as metal. So uh, TV, TV never did work the best inside of stucco houses for that reason. And uh, when you're uh, running 300 ohm wire, that, like we used to do, uh, if you run it horizontally, you can run into a problem too. Because it in itself starts to act like an antenna. And it's closer to the set than the antenna up on the roof. So that can uh, make a, a ghost for you too. So. A 300 ohm wire only works good if it's practically straight up and down or it doesn't travel too far horizontally. When they come out with that 300 ohm quash cable, that was really good. You could run it anywhere you want and no trouble. Now about tubes. There's quite a few tubes in the TV set. 20, 18 to 24, and that means lots of tube testing. You're going to test them all, but uh, I still think one of the best tests is you look at your picture. If the picture is small, you check your power supply, make sure it's up to scratch, and if it is, then you check the horizontal output tube, and you'll probably find that that might be the trouble. I had a couple of interesting cases where you would only get a picture if you turned the brightness down. Not all the way down because you got nothing when it was all the way down. But if it was down near the bottom where you just started to get a picture, you'd still just start to get a picture. And as you turned it up, the picture would start to get bigger. You turn the brightness higher, the picture would get bigger. 
I'd turn it a little higher yet, and it would start to get bigger, and it would go out and get darker and darker and go out. You know what caused that? Hmm? No, the high voltage rectifier do. 1B3 or uh, 1X2B. <laughs> Gets a little bit weak and it'll do that. Ooh. And damper tubes. If you tap on them with your finger like this, if you see any sparks flying around inside them, because <laughs> they have a habit of doing that, that means they're on their last legs and to, to change them fast and get rid of them. And we had lots of trouble with paper condensers, especially if they're mounted close to a tube that's working hard, like a vertical output tube. If the vertical condensers for the vertical oscillator or any, anywhere near the vertical output tube, the heat from that tube will cook them. And as they get hot, over time, when the set's on for a couple hours, the picture will start to shrink up from the bottom because the bias is changing on the output tube. And uh, RCAs used to be famous for that. And the only, the only cure for that was to change all the paper condensers in the vertical circuit. There was about eight of them. We used to just change them all rather than try to find out which one it was. Then you fix one, the next week another one goes. <laughs> so you just change them all and be done with it. And uh, those wax condensers, they're uh, terrible things. Not only do they leak, but they also can get, uh, the wire can come unsoldered inside them. And they can open up or become intermittent. Yeah, they can. How about some of those cheap carbon resistors used to go in your mitten quite what? a bit? Those cheap carbon resistors, they used to, the, the needs of getting them, they get in your mitten very easily too. The carbon resistors don't give too much trouble. They, over a, a long period of time, they lose some of their resistance. I, I take them lots out, the, the, the ends are, are loose. I can't hear you, sir. I've taken lots of resistors out of old TVs that where the ends were loose, they were uh, op open. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well. But they're the real cheap ones. There. There's some glow bar resistors. If you know what a glow bar resistor is, Motorola used them. It's about the size of a 10 watt resistor. It has a wire around each end. It's black, just like this. And it's in series with the filaments. And when it's cold, it's about 300 ohms. So when you turn the set on, nothing much happens. But as soon as it starts to warm up, it comes down in resistance, goes right down to 18 or 20 ohms or something. And uh, they protect the tubes, but you wait a little longer for your set to warm up. Uh, but those things themselves give trouble. They, they don't only uh, burn out, they get a white line right around the middle when they burn out. But sometimes the ends will come unsoldered on them too. What about retrace lines? I've seen lots of problems with you see the retrace lines and I don't know how it looks like. Well, if it's a bad picture tube, if the picture tube is weak, you will probably have them. Uh, if you can adjust them out with the brightness and contrast control, that's probably a weak picture tube. But there's also a capacitor that feeds into the grid of the picture tube. Don't forget the video signal is going into the cathode, but into the grid of the picture tube, there's a capacitor that goes down to the vertical output tube. And that feeds a pulse up to make damn sure that the picture tube is blacked out when vertical retrace occurs. So you can look for that little capacitor, it's connected right into the grid. <coughs> okay. It's called a vertical uh, blanking capacitor. <coughs> well, we got about five minutes left of our session here. Uh, I don't know if I covered everything I wanted to, but uh, I probably didn't. But uh, if there's anything else you can think of to ask me, now would be the time to do it. Uh,
Yeah. Don, what about uh, the damper tube operation? I, uh, I you, you touched on it, but um, what was the purpose of the damper tube? Uh, I know it was a single uh, a single diode uh, with a fair amount of high voltage on it, but what was that doing? Well, it has two or three functions. One function is the flyback has a large kickback voltage, and if you didn't absorb that somehow or other, it just wouldn't work properly. <coughs> so you have to have something to, to use that kickback pulse. That's why they call it a flyback. And of course, that go, they make use of that with the damper tube. It goes into the damper tube, it's rectified, and it's polarized a certain way so that when it comes out, uh, it adds to B plus, and it becomes B plus boost. And don't ever touch B plus boost because you know it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'll know it when you touch that. It's worse than the high voltage up on the picture tube. That just gives you a little snap, but uh, but that B boost can fry you. And I have one other question, if I can ask it now. Uh, in some of the early, earlier sets, there was a split sound, a split sound um, uh, where uh, there was a, a whole separate uh, series of IFs for yeah. sound, apart from video. They, they split the sound up right at the tuner. And why did they get rid of that? Was that just to reduce uh, stage count? I'm not sure why they got rid of it. There was problems with the fine tuning. You had to fine tune in exactly to get the sound. Whereas the other way, if you were off with the fine tuning a little bit, you still got the sound. That was one of the reasons. And uh, it also made a whole extra IF amplifier for the sound, which you could, they didn't need all that, they found. So they eliminated anything to cut corners, you know, and save price. Because there's enough service problems with a TV set without having uh, more built into it. And we used to, I would say we fixed the Irish TV uh, two times, maybe three times a year. Because it was quite common for them to have something go wrong. And, uh, It wasn't like a radio. You fix the radio and it probably last two or three years. Maybe. But, uh, not the TV. And we used to we used to have a kind of a production when we fixed TVs. I had people working for me because we were so busy. I would have two or three guys out in trucks doing service calls. They would check the sets, check the tubes, and they, they, they were really good at making adjustments. They knew every adjustment on all the TVs, but they didn't know how to fix one. But uh, they could tell you if, it was, if there was something wrong with it for sure or not. Uh, Don, we have a question here from George Earl. Yeah, yes, George. Just a quick question. Um, I'm envisioning, you talked about uh, yokes now, is a yoke sort of similar to a coil or what sort of configuration is that? There's four coils in a yoke, two horizontal ones and two vertical ones, and they're all formed so that they are round and they slide over the neck of the picture tube. And you push them up as far as you can go, right up to the... Uh, the bulge where the picture tube bulges out. You put them as far as you can go. If you don't put them all the way up to the front, what is, you'll get some shadowing in the corner of the picture where the beam bends before the picture tube opens up and it'll hit on the glass. So that's why the yoke has to be mounted right up. And it takes a special machine to wind those yokes so that the, they are effective uh, to bend the electron beam at the right place. <coughs> yeah. Don, what uh, tricks did you have for checking the uh, flyback transformers? Well, we had a flyback tester, and uh, 
it wasn't a hundred percent thing. You know, it would it would if there was a good short in it, it would tell you. But some transformers never shorted until the voltage got on them. You know, so it wouldn't tell you that. Uh, you just had to. Uh, if they got a short in them, you just leave it on for a few minutes and see if it start to smoke. <laughs> if it started to smoke, well, you knew it was short. Just you take the back off the TV set, you can tell us the specific order that it makes. Yeah. And I used to be able to, when I was younger, I could go up behind any TV without taking the back off even. I could just stick my head over the back of the TV and I could tell if the horizontal oscillator and I'll put to a transformer we're working because I could hear it, and I could I could hear that till I was about uh, oh about 38, and then it started to fade away. <laughs> <laughs> or did they just make TVs better off you? <laughs> no, 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 I could I could hear better. the horizontal scanning frequency when I was younger, but not a chance no. But do you know that that frequency at 15,750 cycles? around the flyback, you must remember the flyback is vibrating at that rate. You can't hear it, but it does crack the solder yeah. because the solder is uh, being jiggled 15,750 times a second. And there's lots of loose soldering on flyback terminals on circuit boards. <coughs> Not in the old black and white sets though. Yeah. If you were collecting old black and white TVs from that era that you're talking about, which ones would you snap up uh, from a technical well, point of view? Well, now is a good time to do it. There's still some left, you know. But if you wait another five years or so, they're going to be pricey and, and hard to find, just like radios. But now there's still some left, and you can get them for a song. And the, the ones to snap up are... Depending on how much room you got. <laughs> if you got lots of room, uh, if you got lots of room, you snap up a, a, anything you can get. If you don't have too much room, uh, say for the uh, go for the 17-inch uh, mantle TVs. Uh, portables are okay. They're a new uh, later thing, though. I didn't touch on portables today. RCA, GE, Emerson. They all sold Admiral. Admiral. Well, yeah, there's all kinds of makes. Motorola, Admiral, Emerson, Helicrafters, Stuart Warner, uh, Spartan. Uh, they all had their tricks. Uh, Helicrafters uh, had lots of tricks. And uh, one time they made a set that the chassis mounted in the top of the cabinet and all the tubes hung down. <laughs> Not good. See? Not good. <laughs> Did you find that uh, old uh, Zenith used to make a big deal about hand wired and it was so much better? Did you find that they were any better or were they actually worse because they were hand wired? The same with the uh, Heath kits. I mean, well, they weren't worse. Uh, Zenith, Zenith was always a good, one of the better sets made. And uh, the company was a good company. Uh, they would stand behind you, they didn't screw you around or nothing. Not like uh, some other companies, like uh, like Fleetwood, for example, and stuff like that. I had my share of Fleetwood. <laughs> <laughs> so when did the first TV come out then commercially? Well, 1944, you said? Oh, I'm not sure when the first one came out, but the, the first ones that I had up here were in 1954. Yeah. 54. 54. Yeah, that's when the CFRN went on the air. Yeah. And it was a thing that, you know, nobody had a TV to watch it. Nobody wanted to buy a TV because they didn't know if they'd like it or not. And uh, it was just a hard thing to get going, you know. So what we used to do, we, we used to put TVs out on rental basis. And if they liked it, we'd give them the, their rent money back after three months or something. And they could buy one if they wanted, or else they could just keep renting. We had uh, over 200 sets out on rent. That took two guys just to pick up and deliver those things. <laughs> they weren't white either. 
<laughs> and when these TV sets came into the shop, you know, I had to spend my time fixing them. So the boys would take them out in the back. We had an air hose out there with 300 pounds of air. It takes 300 pounds to get that greasy dirt off. 200 pounds won't do it. And we used to blow them out with that uh, air hose, being careful with the loudspeakers. And then we'd take them in and uh, they'd set them up. Uh, it was a chassis and uh, they would hook a yoke to it and a little picture tube and then I would go and check it. And after I found out what was wrong, I'd, uh, I'd say, well, we have to put a, a new uh, uh, filter in this one or a new tra output transformer or something, whatever it was. And then they would put it in. And I was able to fix you know, quite a few TVs a day that way. But I had lots of guys to put them back together and, uh, and to deliver them, too. And uh, it took one person just answering the phone. <laughs> so it was a busy, uh, a busy time for me. Uh, so I guess we'll bring it to a close for today. I want to thank uh, Don very, very much for a very interesting presentation. And